What's up? Yay! We're yeah. here! Finally doing our interview. So, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm, I'm pretty okay. Um, you want to introduce yourself to our people? Um, I'm Aishi Smile. I make electronic music, I guess would be the easiest way to condense it. Very influenced by noise, music, shoegaze, J-pop, a lot of very contrasting elements. And I also run the label Zoom Ones. So what inspires your art? My art is typically not so much inspired by other music. It's more focused on very specific moments, people in my life. I'd say every single song is about a very specific person, very specific moment. I feel like it's best for me to write usually when I have that particular feeling hitting me. And I feel like my process of songwriting isn't very linear. I'll typically write lyrics that you know reflect on a certain period and I'll try to make a sound that feels like a sort of emotion that relates to that feeling. Uh, I'm from originally from Anaheim in Orange County and I think it's inspired my art a lot um, on a I guess you could say even sometimes on a subconscious level um, when I think of Anaheim and I think of places like Orange County I think of the words conservatism, um, assimilation. I think of the need to not really be yourself and the need to, you know, disrupt that sort of environment. Um, Anaheim is a very, uh, it was actually a lot of areas used to be run by the KKK. A lot of government people were involved in the KKK. Even recently, about two weekends ago, there was a huge rally in a park in Anaheim. And I think that really speaks on the level that, you know, we're not really living in like a post-racial society. And I think growing up in that environment, sort of having this people with like a hidden agenda sort of forces you into the shell. You're sort of always paranoid about who you are, who you're with, what you're trying to do. And I'd say where I grew up with, I mean, who I grew up with, where I grew up is influenced my art in a lot of ways and what I'm trying to speak about. Yeah, I, I heard about that and I was so shocked. I was just like, wow, this sounds like a scene pulled straight from 1960. Yeah, yeah, and people got stabbed. Yeah. <laughs> and the way they wrote about it was not very, uh, it seemed like it didn't really care that the KKK were there. So. Yeah, I, I thought that was, so that's a very, it's a very powerful background to be a part of. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's that's such a that's such a that's such a striking image, you know, to, to come from somewhere like that. Mm -hmm. When you started making music, uh, did people know about music, your music? What? Um, who did you share it with? Um, I first started making music that I feel relates to Meishi Smile. Back in high school, I started getting into a lot of Japanese noise and pop music. I had a lot of bands back then with Alex of Plastercast, and he was sort of the person who always pushed me to be where I am now. And we had a lot of noise groups back then, sort of inspired like Boredoms, Animal Collective, those sort of groups. Like we even played Battle of the Bands and whatnot, and like people really hated it, of course. Like they had this like silly thing where they even had like a score sheet and it said like, oh, how well did these people play their instruments? How was their performance? And like, they just like disqualified us because they rated everything so low. So it's just like that kind of environment. Like we're just trying to make like something, you know, you know, from the perspective of like a teenager trying to be subversive, but also in, you know, a conservative environment, you want to try to do something different. Nobody really understood it. Everybody just like people in rock bands and whatnot be like, oh, you make ambient music, you make noise music, that isn't real music. And I feel like a lot of my music, even in a sense now, when I try to, talk about the disparity of pop music, it's almost like a sort of like, fuck you to those people. It's like, okay, well, it's not about just those elements. I feel like what I do, even though it's noisy or you know, a little experimental to people, even though I don't consider myself or my music like that strange, I think it's you know, quintessentially pop music still. I think I'm trying to just do something that tries to relate to the greatest spectrum of people that can relate to me and vice versa. What, so can you tell us about the first song you wrote? The first song I feel felt very real to make she smile. 
was the song Pale and AGS off my first album, Lust. And I wrote those songs when uh, Tumblr was first starting to become popular. And it was sort of about just feeling this disassociation and sort of feeling infatuated with a lot of images and people that come up there. I was sort of uh, into this one particular person who was online and I really want to convey that sense of longing through a digital mean, like digital means. And I think that's sort of when Meishi, at least for when it first started, sort of took on this role of someone who is experiencing very real emotions through a digital vibe and trying to ground themselves in, I guess, sort of a fantastical reality that's primarily stemming from like internet subculture. Yeah. So it sounds like something that's really influenced you is sort of um, the, the digital world. And mm. I'm wondering, um, so who did you share your music with, you know, in that time then? One of the first people who really supported me and that sort of music was actually one of my collaborators, one of the people who's still one of my best friends and I work with all the time, Brian Vu. He was wanting a blog back then and he posted my music, he would always share it. And I think it goes to show a lot that we still come together now and we collaborate. And that even though we are not always talking, we came from a very similar background. We grew up in the same area, we experienced the same things. So even though we don't always, you know, aren't in constant communication, whenever I want to collaborate with him, whenever we want to make something together, I tell him, you know, exactly what I want. I tell him this is sort of the feeling I want to convey and he always understands it. And I think that, you know, it really s speaks on a subconscious bond that we have. Do you think geography is important for you in terms of art? I used to not think so much about it. And Zoom Lens, you know, it was at the beginning really focused on like international pop music and it still is. But I found that I really want to build a foundation here first. I grew up, you know, I grew up with Alex, who's still you know, one of my best friends. He makes music on a plastic house. I have Thought Tempo, Omaimu, other people in California, such as the Blue and the Butchers, we're all very close. And I think that sense of community, being somewhere together is very important. And I think a lot of internet subculture, although I do appreciate it, I feel like a lot of it is stagnating. And I think a lot of people who want to fall under the label of being a net artist fail to realize that the internet should reflect what you want to see in real life. And so I think that's why a lot of my music now, a lot of Zoom Lens is trying to take a sort of a more humanized approach as opposed to just a digital approach. And I want to you know, show the disparity between the two and also show the ways that they merge and relate to each other as well. And I, I think you always need both. I definitely feel that. I, I, can, I think I can sort of hear that in mm. the differences between Lust and Belong. Mm. Um, I, so, you know, I think, I think you always get this question. Why, why did you start Zoom Lens? Uh, Zoom Lens was also created in sort of the space of noise and experimental music. In Orange County, there's a lot of um, there's actually a lot of noise music and you know experimental uh, musicians that are trying to do stuff out there. And I was in that for a while. I knew a lot of people who started their own labels. And one of my first releases was under uh, my old project called Yuko Mata. And my friend released it on a three-inch CDR that he just made at home. And I saw this and I was like, wow, this is something that you could do yourself. This is something that you don't really need others to dictate and you could sort of form your own space and you know, just be yourself. And so I saw that and I wanted to start Zoom Lens and also because I was also pushing against that scene at the time, I was taking interest in wanting to start a project that sounded more like my influences at the time, like a lot of Japanese pop music, like Yasutaka and Akata. And I showed, those, showed, that, showed that music to those, those people in the noise scene. And as much as like, people like that want to say they're being so subversive and in a sense being subversive, being very open-minded to a lot of different things, they would always, dismissed with that music, they'd say, oh, this belongs on the radio, this belongs in this place, this place. And I was like, 
Well, I, I'm making what I consider like pop music, and I think even though it has like elements of noise, it has elements of noise, it has these sort of other experimental elements, and I'm trying to you know convey that in that sense, but nobody really understood it, and so I had to really break off from that, and that's why I started Zoom Minds and started releasing my own music by myself, and just trying to branch out and meet other people. So it sounds like pop music is really important. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk a little bit about that? I guess the word pop is very general. I consider it as something, I think, as I mentioned, something that is trying to reach the greatest like, general capacity of people. And I think my music is pop because I'm trying to convey something that relates to people that are going through similar things I am. And the reason I started to like same Eishi is a pop project was really inspired by Japanese pop music when I first heard Perfume and groups like that, like Salary of Destiny, like Ara Mitsuki. Um, those groups, they had this really contrasting sense of melancholy to them and it really related to my sort of ongoing depression and um, you know, mental health. I feel that it was really sort of strange to see the sadness in it, but also see how happy it is. And I think that sort of speaks on sort of the ups and downs of emotions that I have and then that I've seen in others as well. And so I think that's why I like to call pop music because it's about disparity and it's about contrasting feelings and something that's never really set in stone. Pop music is always changing. It's always, you could interpret this as you want, you know, borrowing from subcultures, sometimes that it will become you know, something bigger and actually realize and actually speak on something like that. You know, those movements like grunge and whatnot, you still have people who came from you know, those backgrounds and they know what they're talking about, but it just happened to be in the right place at the right time and it spoke to a lot of these people who wouldn't normally listen to it. And I hope that's what Meishi can do. I want to push in that direction. I guess, who is your music for then? Or who is your art for? My, my art is for, I think, ultimately, I create it for myself. And if the product is that other people can relate to it and enjoy it however they want and get a positive experience out of it, I don't really care how they interpret it. I think that's um, the beauty and freedom of it, just as hopefully they pay the same respect to me and how I'm treating music as my therapy and as like one of the only voices I really have to talk about how I feel in other ways that I can't. I feel like this is a topic that never gets talked about um, in among circles of um, like musicians of color. Mm. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your cultural and ethnic heritage. Mm. Um, I grew up, well I was born, you know, as a ja half Japanese, half Chinese, um, fourth generation, fifth generation respectively. And I never really met that many other people who had their family lineage was considered so American, but yet they were Asian. And so that's always posed its own set of problems growing up. I was always, I guess, like too Asian for white kids and too white for Asian kids. I never really fit in with other people of color, per se. I was always considered very like whitewashed or um, too Asian for people. And so I think that the themes that are consistent in Meishi and Zoom Lens is always duality. And that duality, I've come to realize the past few years is because I grew up the way I did as a person of color. And I think I want to make my music reflect that and reflect such contrasting elements of you know, genres is because hopefully people can understand that and be like, I feel these sort of waves of emotion too and I feel these, this contrast all the time. And I think that's something that people of color do relate to a lot because there's so much identity crisis, there's so, so much assimilation, so much them trying to, not even realizing that they aren't who they are sometimes. And when that hits, I mean, hopefully they can see that one day and not be completely assimilated. Is that, is, I think it's a very strange experience. It can be a lightning, but it could also be, I feel like it's mostly very angry for a lot of people too, and I think my music is also you know, very lighthearted, but it's also very, can be visceral. Do you think that your art can be identified as Asian American? I, I think it can. I think there are a lot of Asian people I've met 
who see that reflected in my work. But at the same time, I think what I'm doing hasn't completely been accepted amongst a lot of Asian people either. It's interesting because one of my biggest influences is Giant Robot and Eric Nakamura, the person who started that, he said in the intro to one of the first zines that he um, re republished recently is that at the time I was just doing what I liked. I want to talk about you know Asian pop culture even though at the time no Asian people liked it. And that's how I feel that how, like Meishi and Zilman started. But I think as my voice gets clearer, I know how to speak through those avenues. And there are other people who, you know, just find out about it and can just relate to it instantly. I think it's, yeah, it, I, hopefully it is a place where Asian American people can, you know, see it as something that is distinctly so, but also something that can relate to anyone who feels, I guess, marginalized or outcast. I feel that borders are important to... I feel that borders are a particularly powerful part of Zoom Lens, and hmm. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Like an international museum? Borders area. of any sort. Borders of any sort. Mm. Yeah, I think a lot of Zoom Lens is about trying to break out of who you are and trying to almost break the fourth wall. I think Zoom Lens is about creating a reality that is very specific to yourself. And I think, as I was saying, I think a lot of art needs to be grounded in reality, but it's still fantastical and out there. Because I, I think, going back to being a person of color, I think that's how we deal with a lot of reality. We sometimes need an escape, but at the end of the day, we have to face that there's these like, situations we need to take care of uh, coming from who we are, and we need to speak about those issues or else nothing really changes. So I think, Creating both is a good environment because you're saying there is an escape, but how, how can we make this sort of dream, this sort of like weird um, sub-reality that we're creating, our own space, how can we make that bigger and how can we you know, have more people a part of it? So where do you think, where do you think the future of Zoom Lens is? I think the future of Zoom Lens is that, I mean, I guess the general answer is I just want to take it as far as I can go. I really want to bring out a lot more international artists. I really want to have that foundation established here where such as a lot of artists I love on Zoom lines, like Olsing Pistol, Yule, LLL. There's, nice, there's so many that haven't been to the US before. And I think there's still such a stigma about you know, East Asian music, yeah, music of any place that isn't from like a very westernized background and hopefully create that space for them, but not as a space of where people can just say, oh, sort of, you know, as a trend, be like, this is, oh, this is so quirky, this is so different because it's not, you know, American. I want it to be like, this is who they are as a person and just happen to make amazing art and like see them for who they really are, but still understand the implications of their differences and are, you know, all like different backgrounds. And just, I guess, just creating a bigger acceptance of that and you know, just expanding on the community aspects of it. Do you think art is political? I've thought about this a lot. I had this conversation once with Mark Rodito, uh, you know, his music. Um, he's saying that from what I remember, that is a both fortunate and unfortunate situation growing up as a person of color. And being an artist or anyone who has like a voice is that you're sort of thrown into the situation where no matter what you do, you're sort of speaking on the, you know, not speaking on the behalf, but you know, have a voice that you know, people can see and be like, oh, this is an Asian person, for example, who is doing what they do and suddenly it becomes political because they are who they are. I, I guess people can take that however they want. Maybe they don't like the term Asian American and they just want to be who they are. But I, I think, yeah, my music, my music I feel is very political. I feel like I'm really trying to you know, relate to people who 
are going through those same experiences of being um, marginalized or a person of color. How do you think, um, what are you excited about for the show tonight? The show tonight, this is my first time playing for like an Asian American like student alliance. And so I've never done that before. I've never really played to something that's, um, I know that it's not you know only going to be um, Asian people. I know it's um, still very, um, what's the word? Yeah, and like, like including, you know, it includes everyone still. And I, I think that, you know, having that space is really good. And I think it's gonna be a very positive experience and hopefully there are people who, even if they haven't heard my music for the first time, they can enjoy it and perhaps like see like what we just talked about in terms of you know, Asian person creating art that's very uh, um, trying to be disruptive, trying to come to terms with who one, um, the self is and how those experiences are very truly um, being a person of color or just being anyone who has just felt you know, different, I guess. Yeah. Welcome to Vassar. How's Vassar treating you so far? Uh, I've only been here a few hours, but I really like the campus and I think it's a good feeling being here and playing to the people that I'll be playing to. Tonight. That's what I'm the most excited about. And what do you think about New York? I really enjoy New York. I think it's such a contrast from being in LA. Um, I haven't really experienced it too much out of playing shows, but the friends I have here are some of the most inspiring friends I have. And so I think that speaks on a lot of levels of this sort of environment that is fostering as far as music and art goes. What's, uh, what's going on tomorrow? Uh, tomorrow, we're having a release party, um, two shows actually, with Boxes and Fiction and Alex of Plastic House. It's his release party, and we're having a lot of other people on Zoom Lens, such as DVI and Talon, performing as well. And this is sort of the first Zoom Lens party that's happened. And I'm happy to say that because I haven't played a show with a lot of these people. And I think it'll be interesting to see how people react here as opposed to what we have in LA. What's something that you'd hope that your art could say to someone who um, is sort of in a similar situation? I think it's very general and simplified, but I think the message is always just to be yourself and respect yourself and that what you're placed into, what people expect of you, isn't always who you should be. And you should try to take the steps necessary to realize yourself and I guess to belong to your own. Yeah, so I think that wraps it up. Thank you so much for being here for an interview also and playing the show tonight. So yeah. we've got to get running. We've got to go <laughs> set up the show. So Good. thank you again. Uh, thank you for doing this. Mm -hmm. We're good? <laughs> okay, can you get that camera for us? <laughs>